passage we're going to be in today is Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to be looking at the Lord's Prayer. But I want to begin by simply reading verse 6, because verse 6 is, encapsulates this idea of the iceberg prayer life. And I want you to hear what it says. It reads like this. It says, but you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. I call that my prayer closet. And it says, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. He's in there with you. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. The Titanic, the largest and most luxurious ship of its time, it had a double bottom hull divided in 16 sections. Now because four of these sections could be flooded and it wouldn't impact the buoyancy of the ship, they considered the Titanic unsinkable. But on its main voyage, on April 14, 1912, it was going from Southampton, England, to New York City. And as it was going along, about midnight, it struck an iceberg, as we all know. A story that, that we still know uh, fresh today. It collided with this iceberg and five of those compartments were ruptured. Remember, four would, would rupture and it wouldn't sink, but it got five compartments. They ruptured and the ship eventually sank. And some estimate that over 2,000 people died that, that early morning when the Titanic sank. You know, it's long been proven that when it comes to icebergs, that 90% of the iceberg is below the surface of the water. Only 10% of the iceberg is shown. That's how we get that expression, the tip of the iceberg. 10% above the water, 90% below the water. And so when the Titanic hit that iceberg, that iceberg didn't move. Because it was so massive. And so the Titanic took the damage and it sank. And this brings us to what I call the 1090 principle. The iceberg prayer life. An iceberg prayer life is when our prayers are only 10% seen and 90% unseen. So think about when you pray. Think about your prayer life right now and ask yourself this question. How many of my prayers are seen and how many of my prayers are in the secret place that we just read about? It should be about 10% seen and 90% unseen like the iceberg. Now, with your prayer journal, today what I want you to do is I want you to kind of turn to the back and reserve the last three or four pages to answer prayer. So just go to the back, take three or four pages and write on one of the pages, answer prayer prayer. And the reason I want you to do that, and I had shown mine last week, I'm, I've got about two and a half pages, almost three pages of answered prayers. And, and that's an individual answer per line. That's a lot of answered prayer. Here's why I want to do that is because this is, helps to build up that prayer life, that iceberg prayer life, that strong prayer life is that when you're recording how God answers your prayers, then whenever you're going through a hard time, whenever you're worried, whenever you're concerned, you can pick up your journal and you can remind yourself, God answers prayers. And it will encourage you in some of the most discouraging times of life. So I want you to have that answered prayer section in the back of your journal. And now today, we're going to be looking at Jesus' model prayer. And we find this prayer is both in Matthew and it's in Luke. Now we're going to be looking at the Matthew passage today. But I, just for a moment, I want you to see the context of the passage in Luke. And I'm going to read one verse. It's Luke 11. 1. Here's what it says. Now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray as John taught 
his disciples. Now, the reason that's meaningful to me is because Jesus prayed in such a way that 10% that was seen, he prayed in such a way that his disciples says, we see how you pray. Will you teach us how to pray? You know how to pray. Teach us how to pray. And, and, and so as they asked that question, he went into his model prayer, the one that we're going to see in Matthew, the exact same prayer he, it, that we're looking at today. But I just want you to understand that Jesus knew how to pray. In the Matthew passage, Jesus first shows us two things that hinder prayer. And then he shows us five petitions that are important to prayer. So let's begin by looking at the two hindrances of prayer. The first one is vain glory. You see it in verse 5. It says that when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the street that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. You know what Jesus was teaching us there in that part of the model prayer? He's teaching us that we should not pray to impress. We shouldn't pray prayers of performance that makes us the center of attention. That should be why we want to pray. Because those around you are not the audience. Those that you want them to hear how eloquent you pray, they're not your audience. There's an audience of one when we pray, and, and that's God. And, and if you think that the people around you hearing your eloquent prayer is the audience, then, then you're sadly mistaken, and your priorities are out of order. So he says, don't pray to impress. That's just vain glory. And, and so you might ask the question, well, when should we pray in public? Well, I thought of a few, and this is by no means an exhaustive list, but I wanted to give you three examples. The first example is over your meal. You should pray over your meal out loud with whoever surrounds you. Every time we have a meal at home, we say the blessing over the meal. When our grandboys are with us, we let one of them lead the blessing of the meal. We do it out loud as a group. When, and listen... I believe that if you're in a restaurant, you should say the blessing over your meal. Back in my corporate days, I would have some, uh, you know, vice president or somebody from my company take me out to lunch, and we'd go to lunch, and I'd simply say this: Would you mind if I bless this meal? I now never had anybody ever say, "Oh no, you can't do that here." They'd always say, "Please do, please do." I think that we should pray publicly over our meals. Listen to 1 Timothy 4, 4 through 5. It says, For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it's received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the Word of God and prayer. That's why we bless our food. We want to receive it with thanksgiving. We want the, the Lord to sanctify it for it to go in our bodies. And I'm going to tell you, I've said in front of a few meals that I was like, Lord, please bless this mess. <laughs> Most of them I could. Lord, bless this because I'm about to put it in my body. And, and so we receive it with thanksgiving. Another time that we, uh, we should pray publicly is when we're praying to encourage others. Listen to Colossians 1.9. Paul says, for this reason, we also now, now here those, those, uh, the, the we's here. It says, uh, for this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. In other words, Paul said, hey, we as a group are praying for you, Church of Colossae. That's what he's saying to them. We're praying as a group. And many times we see in the Bible where the church of Acts, where uh, those believers would meet in that upper room and it said they continued steadfastly in prayer. And they were praying as a group. Some places we read that they lifted their voices together in prayer and they're praying as a group. So there's certainly times that we should be praying publicly and out loud. Another example I thought of is prayers of agreement. 
Matthew 18, 19 says, Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. There's times when we need to come and pray together for God to move. But here's what I'm saying to you is, is yeah, public prayer, prayer, yes, there's places for that. But if your prayer life is 90% public and 10% secret, you got a problem. And so then Jesus tells us in verse 6, we need to make most of our prayers private. Let's read it again. It says, but you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So why, why is it so important for us to pray in secret? For us to pray by ourselves? Well, one thing is a practice of humility. We're humbling ourselves before the Lord. And so He says, make most prayers private. Why? Not only to practice humility, but to be real. When we get along with Him, we can be real. We can pray stuff to Him that we can't pray in public. Mm -hmm. We can pour out our heart to Him. We can be one-on-one -on -one with God. No interruptions. That's why secret prayer is so important. Then, then Jesus gives us the second hindrance to prayer. It's vain repetitions. Matthew 6, 7, and 8. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. For your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. Now this vain repetitions here, it refers to prayers of repetitive and personally meaningless words. I remember when I was a little kid, I remember the two prayers I wanted to pray as a small child, and you probably do too. The first one was my blessing and my food. God is great. God is good. Let us thank Him for our food. Right? By His hands we are fed. Thank you, Lord, for daily bread. And I prayed that prayer as a small child every time I was asked, and so did my sister. And then the other one I was taught was when I go to bed. That was the tough one, right? We'd say, I would say, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray, pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Well, can I tell you something? I accepted Jesus Christ as an eight-year-old boy. And I remember my dad come to me and he, he says, now son, now you're a Christian. Now you're, you have the Holy Spirit in you and now you need to walk away from those childish prayers. You need to pray from your heart. You need to pray, let the Holy Spirit. And I just remember, that's when my prayer life changed. And it's still growing. It's still growing today, but, but vain repetitions. Now, it's okay for little children, but man, when we become a child of God, we need to be real. Amen. I mean, if, if you're praying and you're just you're just mimicking words that you've said over and over before, you, you might as well not pray. I don't believe God's listening to that. In verse 7, he says, And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Well, that might lead us to say, well, should I not keep repeating the same prayer? That's not what I'm saying. Okay? That's not what I'm saying. Here, there's a difference between vain repetition and sincere persistence. There's a difference. For example, in Luke 18, 1 through 8, the widow woman petitioning the judge was persistent and she finally received justice. In Luke 11, 5 through 8, the neighbor who came at midnight was persistent and he finally received food. I think about Mark 10, verses 46 through 52. Blind Bartimaeus was persistent and he received his sight. And in Matthew 15, 22 through 28, the woman of Canaan was persistent and her daughter was healed. There's a difference between vain repetition and sincere persistence. 
So I'm not telling you don't pray the same prayer over and over. Just check your heart and make sure that's where that prayer is coming from. And it's just not a product of your lips. Vain repetitions. And then Jesus turns to His prayer and He gives us five petitions of prayer that we should model our prayer after. Now again, this is not exhaustive. This is not the only things you should pray in prayer. But these are the things that Jesus said, you know, include these things in your prayers. The petition is a formal request to an authority regarding a particular cause. That's what a petition is. And Jesus is going to give us five particular causes that should be regular petitions in our prayer life. And the first one is this, for God to make His name holy. Matthew 6, 9, In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Holy be your name. That first petition is our desire for God to be honored. His name, His attributes are like no other. And, and so His name should be set apart as greater and more special than all other names. You know, this is a truth so significant that it's one of the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20, verse 7 says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And you go, oh, I never do that because you think of how people use it as a cuss word, right? But do you ever call on the name of God with that vain repetition? Do you ever call on the name of God with that vain glory? That's taking His name in vain. Do you ever call on the name of the Lord not really believing He's going to answer? That's taking His name in vain. So there's so many ways we can do that, but, but it's a truth so significant. He made it one of the Ten Commandments. And not only that, it's a truth so holy that the Jewish scribes before writing Jehovah as the name of God, had to clean their pens and had to wash their entire body in a pool of natural flowing water every time they was going to write the name of God. He deserves such honor. Then Jesus goes on in verse 10 and He says, Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now this second petition asks for God's kingdom to be advanced in this world through us. That's what we're asking. Because we're praying to Him, we're saying your kingdom come, your will be done. Well, who's He going to do His will through? You and me. And so we're asking for His kingdom to be advanced on that earth through us. And when we pray, listen to me, when we pray, it's not to bend God's will to our ever-changing, imperfect desires. That's not why we should pray. When we pray, it should be us yielding ourselves to the perfect wills and desires of God for our life. What is God's will? If we're praying for God's will, what is God's will? Well, the word, God's Word is full of God's will. I'll give you three quick examples. 1 Timothy 2, 3-4 through 4 says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's God's will. Everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. Micah 6, 8 says, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? So what is God's will? It's for us to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly. Listen, there's a combination thing going on here. If you're praying all the time, yeah, let's say you got that 90, that I swear prayer life going on. You got that 90% in the secret place. But are you getting in this word? Are you getting in His Word in the secret place? Because only when you get in His Word are you going to learn His will. Right. His Word is His will. So it's not enough to just show up and pray. Listen, He'll listen to our prayers. He'll listen to us talk to Him. But you know what He wants? He wants us to listen to Him talk to us. And His will is in His Word. Here's another example. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 And everything gives thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. 
So that's just three of many verses throughout God's Word that teach us His will. And then we should bend ourselves to His will, not try to bend Him to our will in our prayers. And then Jesus talks about daily bread in verse 11. He says, give us this day our daily bread. And this petition is asking God to provide for all of our needs. And it's an acknowledgement that we need His provisions daily. We're acknowledging that. And I love the way it's worded. It says, give us this day. This day. You know what that does? That teaches us that our dependence is on the Lord every day. We need it this day. We're going to be dependent on Him tomorrow. We're going to be dependent on Him the next day. But let's focus on this day, Jesus says. And, and further down in that same chapter, verse 34, listen, Jesus says, Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Listen, just focus on the day. Just take God's provisions for today. You might have something coming up that you're all anxious and worried about. Don't be. When that day comes, let's see what God will do for you. Let's see what He'll do. Give us this day our daily bread, Lord. And then He says, forgive us our debts. In verse 12, it says, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now this petition it's unique compared to all the others. You know why? Because this request for pardon, it comes with a very distinct stipulation. Look at it again. It says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You know, here's the thing about human beings is that we forgive ourselves way easier than we forgive anybody else. We got way more grace for us than we have for anybody else. But listen, if we want the Lord to forgive us, we need to be forgiving to those around us. We can't be unforgiving to everybody else and think that God's going to forgive us. No, forgive us as we forgive those around us. Let's talk about God's forgiveness for just a moment because it's kind of hard sometimes to understand how it works. God's forgiveness is in two parts. The first is the pardon that Christ provided on the cross over 2,000 years ago for all of our sins. Provided it 2,000 years ago for all of our sins. And then the second part is the daily washing away of sins as we commit them. That's the two parts of forgiveness. Now, if Jesus' sacrificial pardon forgave all of our sins then why do we need to go to Him daily and ask for forgiveness? You know, there's a, there's a uh, teaching out there uh, in the quote-unquote Christian world that says that once you're saved, you don't have to ask forgiveness for sins anymore. Listen, if you've ever heard that teaching or you hold to that teaching, you're deceived. That's not true. And I'm going to show you how I can say that so matter-of-factly. See, here's the, the thing. The first pardon was a judicial forgiveness which was needed to fulfill the law. A judicial forgiveness needed to fulfill the law. The second is a relational forgiveness that keeps us in right relationship with God. I'm going to show you how that works. In 1 John 1, 7 through 9, it says, If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. There's the judicial forgiveness. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, paid the price for all of our sins to be forgiven. But then He goes on and He says this, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's the relational forgiveness I'm talking about. The daily cleansing. So there's that judicial forgiveness and there's, there's a relational forgiveness. Now I got a little example that maybe will help bring it a little more down to earth because it's still, it's, it's hard to really understand it all. But think about this. Think about water coming to your house. You have water in a main pipe coming to your house, and anytime you want water, what do you do? You turn a tap on. 
Maybe it's in the kitchen. Maybe it's in the restroom. Maybe you're washing your hands. You turn a tap on. And when you turn the tap on, the water flows out. Well, that's how forgiveness is. See, the forgiveness has already been provided. Like the water, it's there. But there's something you have to do to receive it. And what you have to do is you have to go to the Father and say, Father, I know that yesterday I really messed up. I know you can't be pleased with me. And so I'm just, I'm just confessing to you right now. And I'm asking you, will you forgive me? I'm going to try not to do that again. That's turning the tap on. That's taking advantage of the forgiveness that He's got piped right to your heart. And all you got to do is ask. And then He gives us the fifth petition, deliver us from temptation. Matthew 6, 13, the first part of 13 says, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now that final petition is a prayer for protection against both temptation and the evil one. Now that's two different things. Temptation is your flesh. And so he says, protect us against this temptation and against Satan. Against the evil one that wants to ruin our lives. And and you know, this is a plea for help to keep us away from the things that are going to damage our integrity. We're saying, Lord, help us here. Keep us from these things that's going to damage us, that's going to hurt our witness. And, and remember, this series is real. I told you at the beginning, this is really a series about corporate prayer. But to get us to where we pray with greater strength corporately, we need to make sure that our personal prayer lives are where they need to be. He says, lead us not into temptation. He says, deliver us from the evil one. You know why he says it like that? Because he's saying that my sins affect us. My misconduct affects us. Your misconduct affects us. So we all need to keep our sin in check. We need to be washed daily because our sins are going to impact the body of Christ. And, and we're the body of Christ. This church is the body. 1 Corinthians 12, 26 says, And if one member suffers, all members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. You as an individual impact this body. Deliver us from temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. Okay, so I'm going to give you one more exercise for your prayer journal and then we're going to close this message. Today, I want you to begin a section on you. I want you to allow several pages for a section for you and you can just... Put your name at the top of it or however you want to do it. Just, I just want you to have a dedicated section for you. In this section, what I want you to do is I want you to begin by making a list of the things that most tempt you so that you can begin to pray for them. That's called praying defensively. That's where you're learning about the things that tempt you. You know what they are. And by putting them down on a piece of paper here and opening this up each day and praying over it, you're praying defensively. Lord, help me to resist them to this temptation. Do not lead us into temptation. Deliver us from evil. So I want you to begin by making a list of the temptations you battle so you can pray defensively. Then as you're praying, God's going to speak to your heart how to overcome these temptations. And I want you to record those actions that God gives you to fight those temptations. For example, places or situations or people you should avoid. Maybe there's a certain place that if you go there, you know it's too tempting. Okay, Lord, you, I know you don't want me to go there. I just got to put it down now because when I'm tempted, I'm going to want to go. But put down those Actions that will help you fight the temptations. And then the third thing I want you to do is I want you to write scriptures about overcoming temptations and sins. Write scriptures. So when I open up this section of my journal, I pray the scripture over myself. I pray for the temptation. I hope I don't lose this today because somebody is going to be tempted to take this home and read it. So, but I have in here the things I struggle with. And I also have ways that I know that the Lord wants me to
to, to fight those battles. I want to give you a couple of examples of scripture I have written in my journal. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man, Barry. God is faithful and He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, Barry. But with the temptation, He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it, Barry. Claim it for yourself. One more, James 4, 7. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. And I have other scriptures that, that I pray those scriptures for me to, to fight that battle of temptation. So today's journal exercise is you building out that section for you. For you. Now, he ends the prayer like this. God's kingdom, power, and glory. Look at the end of verse 13. It says, For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus ends His model prayer by acknowledging who He's praying to. The only true God of all the ages. Listen, we live in His kingdom. We rely on His power. And only His glory will be forever. That's the one we're praying to. Who else would you want to pray to?